Good evening, everybody, and welcome to tonight's European Green Youth webinar. Our topic tonight is the disturbing subject of tree diseases. Our presenter this evening is Dr. Francis Giaquinto, and some of you might remember Fran from a webinar earlier in the summer, which dealt with invasive alien species. Fran is an ecologist with over 20 years experience in researching plant fungi relationships, both within commercial and academic settings. And in 2019, Fran was awarded Chartered Environmentalist status because of her work with invasive alien species. So with that, I'll hand you over to Fran. So good evening, everyone. And thank you very much for coming to this um, webinar on invasive tree diseases. And many thanks to Limerick City and County Council for hosting this event under the European uh, Green Leaf Award. So without further ado, well, I'll get started. Um, I'm going to cover um, four main topics this evening. First of all, just spend a few minutes talking about the role of trees in our landscapes, and then uh, discuss what invasive tree diseases are. Um, I'll give a few examples of past, current, and potential future tree diseases, and then go on to talk about ways um, by which we can help. So, and actually there was just somebody in the audience who, who asked this morning about how to um, identify ash dieback. And this, this tree here is a very good example. So at this time of year, when, when ash trees are infected, you can see this bare tips. You have lots of small bare tips. And here you can see that the whole canopy has no leaves, there may be leaves further down. But this is one of the characteristic features at this time of year. So just in answer to that question. So I'd just like to spend a few minutes talking about the role of trees in our landscapes. And I think if you, if you all just reflect for a moment, um, there will be at least one tree um, that you can think of which has had some meaning for you. It may have been because you've had the fortune to um, be around a very old veteran tree like this uh, native, black, native black poplar becoming very rare. You may have played in trees as children. Um, you may have used trees in some kind of remembrance way to, uh, to remember a loved one. And, and all over the world, people are planting trees. In Ethiopia, for instance, uh, they have literally planted millions and millions and millions of trees. And why, why is that happening? What, what's, the, what's the purpose of it? Well, trees form a very important component of our ecosystem services. And our ecosystem services is a term um, coined by the economists, and it means the many benefits that people freely gain from the natural environment. Uh, and with trees, um, ecosystem services are divided into different categories. Um, they're all awkward terms, but you have the regulating services. And for trees, their main role is in what's called carbon sequestration. So this is the absorption of carbon, the storage of carbon within their trunks and branches, in their roots and in the soil around them. And this is worth 180 million between 1990 and 2013 in Ireland. It's a very important kind of service that trees provide. Uh, they also control our water levels. You know, they can, they have a very important role to play in, in flood control, in runoff, in the level of the water table. I mean, this, this hasn't been quantified for Ireland, but everywhere, the, all the regulation of water in the environment, um, it is being mediated by trees and woodland. Our cultural services, the recreation, the landscape value of trees and woodlands in our urban and rural areas and, and human health. And there's a huge amount of research at the moment, largely coming out of Japan um, with the, the, the forest bathing, um, where they are showing that actually for people being in the natural environment, being amongst trees has a huge impact on, on mental health. You know, people who are suffering from mental health, they may, they may experience reduced suicide ideation they may be, um, experience improved mood and so on and so forth. It's, uh, our environment has this role of, of soothing, soothing the soul and it's worth 179 million in Ireland. And then there's these provisioning services so that this is all, all the things that trees provide for us. It's the, the food in terms of nuts and berries, it's the timber for construction, it's fuel, it's for firewood and so on and the habitat services. And this is where how trees provide habitats for wildlife. 
And also trees play a very important role in the formation of soil and the, maintain, the maintenance of, of, a, of, a, of fertile and nutrient rich soils. And back in 2015, the Irish government did a cost benefit analysis of Ireland's forests based on, this is a kind of classic way of analysing the, the value um, to people on this willingness to pay, how much people are willing to pay um, in order to protect their forests and their woodlands. Um, and in, in Ireland it's 68 million. This is less than in the rest of Europe, but that's probably a reflection of the fact that we have so little tree cover. Um, Ireland has 11% tree cover um, compared to a much greater percentage in other parts of Europe. So the government has been talking a lot about planting trees, planting forests as a climate change abatement measure. Now this is to kind of mitigate the, the volumes of carbon dioxide that are in the atmosphere which are causing all these problems. And all plants absorb carbon dioxide they, they, and they store carbon within their systems. But just because of the very size of trees, um, they store huge amounts. And here is this lovely native black poplar again. And here the carbon is in the branches, it's in the trunks, it's in the roots, it's in the soil around the roots. Now, the government's, the government's kind of policy of planting trees is a very good one. As it, and, you know, and globally, there's a huge movement to, to um, plant trees. But the subject of my talk tonight is about tree diseases and, the, and the, the rate at which tree, de tree diseases are increasing globally. And the risk is that as far as fast as we plant trees, they may die. And when a, and a dead tree, has the opposite effect of a living tree. And here, here's an example of a dead tree with massive carbon dioxide release. So if we're going to plant trees for climate change abatement, then we need to deal with the tree diseases to make sure that the trees stay healthy. Okay. So what else about the role of trees in our landscape? You know, those habitat services. Well, you know, is a tree an individual organism? Is a, is a tree just a tree? You know, is a tree a 100% tree? This is an 800 year old beach in, in Hampstead Heath in London. Well, no, and some excellent research from, from England has shown, this is partly the Wildlife Trust, the Offal Woodland and Wildlife Trust, a combination of research, which has shown that here on the left are our native species, and here on the right, the number of associated insects and lichens. Now, the term associated is, is a biological term, and it means that those insects and lichens prefer that tree species in order to derive the nutrients and the shelter and everything else that, that a species will need in order to live. Okay. And, the, and the extraordinary thing here is if we look at ash, our European ash, is it has a 1,028 associated insects and lichens. And that doesn't even include the mosses and the fungi and the birds and so on and so forth, the other wildlife. Our oak, pedunculus and sessile oaks, which are often seen as some of the most biodiverse trees in, in Western Europe has 747, far fewer than ash. Our humble willow, often seen as a weed, um, part of scrub that nobody really wants, 610 species. Our birch, often seen as a weedy species, 463 species and so on. So uh, our trees, every single tree, when you're looking at a woodland, you're not just seeing, you know, half a dozen tree species. You're seeing half a dozen tree species with literally hundreds hundreds and hundreds and hundreds, if not thousands, of species which are relating with that host tree. Now with ash, those 1,028 species, 400 of those, 40% of those, are what are known as obligate. And obligate means that they have to have that host. They cannot survive. Now you're all familiar with um, the, the problem of ash dieback. You'd have all have heard of ash dieback, which is killing our ash trees. Now, if our ash trees are removed from the environment, there's gonna be this mass homelessness event. Those 400 species that have to have ash to live on, what's going to happen to them? They may perish. And this is really what's known as the kind of the sixth extinction. You know, it's the, the fact that there's this web of life where everything is relating with everything else. Nothing exists in isolation, that you take out one cog, one cog out of the, of the wheel of life, and it has this huge cascade effect of massive loss of species associated. So just as an example, let's have a look at the ecosystem services of ash trees. 
Okay, so, you know, Ash has played a huge part in myth and folklore in, in the Celtic tradition and in, and in many parts of Europe. In, in Denmark, um, the ash is seen as the queen of the forest. You know, her branches reach up to the sky and her roots traverse the earth. You know, she's regarded as the most important tree in the forest. But from the economist's point of view and from the naturalist's point of view, what are the roles of, what is the role of an ash tree? Well, nutrient cycling. An ash tree has the level and proportion of nutrients without, within ash leaves are better than any other native species. So when, when the autumn, when those ash leaves fall to the ground, they rot into the soil and those nutrients are released and they form the perfect fertile soil. Ash are really important soil improvers. Ash produces higher quality timber faster than any other species. Ash can produce good quality timber in 70 years. Our ash trees improve the economic productivity of our hedgerows in terms of being able to remove um, timber from it, in terms of those habitat services, the ecological corridors those hedgerows form. They sport ground dwelling flora. Ash leaves come out later in the spring than most other tree leaves. And that means that the sun, you know, the canopy, the canopy is, doesn't close over early and it allows this rich ground flora to develop, very characteristic of ash woodlands. The biodiversity, I've talked about that with those 1,028 species and those 400 obligate that cannot survive without ash. Provide shade. Well, uh, Ken Whelan um, gave a very interesting talk on rivers um, as part of his webinar series a few weeks ago, and he talked about the importance of keeping our water bodies cool in the face of climate change, because as the water bodies heat up, the invertebrate species are lost, and that means the fish populations are lost. And so the importance of actually keeping the ground, keeping, keeping the rivers, keeping our water bodies cool. Specialist products, here's a photograph of the famous Irish Hurley that is being made in East Clare. And also many of the sort of 18th and 19th century furniture, the very fine antique furniture, it was made of ash, makes a very fine um, furniture wood. Regulates water levels. If you take all the ash out of a habitat, the water table rises. It controls, it regulates water levels. Pollution control, whoops. Pollution control. Um, ash may not be the best for this, but trees in general have, they can absorb, they, they can absorb contaminants in soil and they store them in their mycorrhizal and their symbiotic fungi on the root systems and they can absorb particulates out of the air, contaminants out of the air. And finally, high, high landscape value in our urban landscapes, in our rural landscapes. Ash, with the, her, her delicate, her magnificent shape, um, brings great pleasure, great, brings great visual appeal. So I hope that's convinced you that we need our trees. And they play a very important function in our lives. It's not just about being visually appealing and, and being pleasant to be around. Um, actually, without, without our trees, um, human species don't function nearly so well in terms of the relationship with, that we have with our environment. So what do we know about invasive alien tree pathogens? You know, these, in, these invasive diseases which have started to come into um, Ireland and elsewhere. Well, we know that we can't see them most of the time and they belong to three groups. So they're the fungi, there's at least a million and a half species of fungi on the planet and they're all genetically very adaptable, very fluid. They can change very easily. They can change from one form into another very, very easily. Uh, in insects. This is the emerald ash borer, which is currently um, devastating forests in the United States, ash forests in the United States, and here you can see its tracks. And then bacteria. Now bacteria wouldn't be well known as tree diseases, they do come into crop diseases a lot, but not so much into tree diseases, but currently our olive, the olive forests, the olive groves of the Mediterranean are being devastated. Some of these olive trees are a thousand years old, they've survived this length of time, only now to succumb by this bacterium, Xylella fastidiosa. We do know, even though these, these um, tree diseases are not designated 
as invasive, invasive alien species. They don't come under the same category, they don't come under the same legislation, but they behave just like invasive alien species. And I think one of the problems that we've had in Ireland and in Europe and globally is that we've been so focused on plant invasive alien species. Here's a colleague of mine cutting down giant hogweed, Japanese knotweed, you'll all be familiar with that, mink, the damage that does to fish stocks and wildfowl populations. And we've spent so much time focusing on these that we haven't actually seen. We literally haven't considered these hidden problems, the insects and the fungi and the other microbes. And here is a young ash tree with, with the very characteristic lesion beneath the node. We all know about the impact of invasive alien species in terms of giant hogweed and Japanese knotweed and so on. Here is mink um, destroying fish populations. Um, these invasive alien species, they disrupt our ecosystems, sometimes irreversibly. Once you have something like giant hogweed into an environment, it can alter the soil pH, it can alter the soil composition, and in some cases it can make it impossible that even if you remove that invasive species, Native species can't colonize because the ground has been so disrupted. We have these public health hazards. Here's this very ominous. This is the Asian hornet and the damage that it caused. Giant hogweed, you'll know about the burns from that. Um, oak processionary moth is another one which actually is a public health hazard. And then finally, the impact of invasive species. You know what? The, the impact of invasive species is at the same level as the impact of climate change and habitat fragmentation in terms of the cause of the main causes of biodiversity, the loss of biodiversity. And in fact, it's thought now that at least a fifth of extinctions, plant and animal extinctions um, on the planet are due to invasive species. And that includes these tree pathogens. So what else then? So we know that these invasive tree diseases, they're either fungi, bacteria or insects. We know they have all the characteristics of invasive alien species, even though they're not designated as such. And that means the speed of, speed of dispersal is very characteristic um, and that they cause massive economic and environmental problems. And really the, the, the main cause of invasive species of tree pathogens is because human activities have interrupted thousands of years of co-evolution. You know, and that's because of globalization. Now we have this kind of global movement of people. We have this global movement of live plant products. We have many um, products that are transported in wood packaging. And wood packaging can be one, can, can harbor many, many diseases. You know? And here on the left, here, this is, this is co-evolution. So on my, on my thumb here is what looks like a, a, a little piece of twig, but actually this is its face and this is a moth. This is the birch buff moth. And it has co-evolved with birch trees over thousands of years. You don't have this kind of mimicry developing overnight. You know, this is a relationship between the birch buff moth and the birch trees, which has evolved where the relationship is so intimate, so tight, and it has evolved over thousands of years and no harm is caused. Whatever the dynamics of that relationship, there's no harm. But here on the right, you have the oak processionary moth. So this is alien, this has come in from Asia and it's arrived onto, this is an English oak tree, probably 900 years old, thousand year old oak tree. And it's completely succumbing to the processionary moth because it has no experience of it. They haven't co-evolved together. There's no, the tree has no resistance mechanisms against, against this particular um, insect. It's never experienced it before. And this is, this, this global, COVID is the same. COVID-19 is exactly the same. It's, it's, um, it's arrived and we as humans have got no, we've got no resistance. We've, our physiology, our immune systems have, have had no experience of it. And so we, we, we're not able to, we're not able, able to resist to it. We, we succumb to it. And this is what's happening over and over and over again globally, this disruption of co-evolution, which is allowing these insects, these fungi and bacteria to take on a different role that whereas once they might 
might have been quite harmless, now they become seriously damaging in the new environments in which they find themselves. We also know that pathogen arrivals are increasing globally. And this is some interesting data from New Zealand where they've shown that between 1930, which is, it's, it's looking at the mean annual rate of pathogen arrivals relative to the volumes of trade on an annual basis. And um, they can, you can see here that between 1930 and the late 1970s, there was an exponential rise in pathogens arriving into New Zealand. And then it kind of got halted round here, round 1980. And this was because New Zealand introduced very strict biosecurity. So they, they built in strict phytosanitation at the ports, checking all materials coming into the country, making sure that live plant products weren't, weren't diseased, limiting the types of products, the types of organisms that were allowed into the country, um, having only allowing um, packaging material which is chemically treated, um, checking everything at the ports to make sure that nothing, no pathogens could arrive. And they managed to, to halt for a while, they managed to halt the kind of this, this rate of arrival, but they were focused on the biosecurity for crops and they didn't consider forest pathogens. And what's happening here is you have this rate of increase increasing again, and that's a reflection of the forest pathogens. And now they need to introduce the biosecurity to prevent the, the forest pathogens coming in. So this is an interesting example of how important actually biosecurity hygiene is in terms of preventing the arrival of these species. Okay, so we know now that tree pathogens, they're fungi, bacteria, they're insects. We know that it's the breakdown of coevolution which is causing their rapid arrival, their rapid spread. We know that biosecurity methods can stop them. We know that they've, the main spread of these species is via trade, it's via globalization, it's via the movement of people and plants and wood materials. So let's just have a look at some of the examples of the, um, some of the most kind of well-known examples of tree diseases, which have had a very big economic and environmental impact. Well, the first one was chestnut blight, and none of us are old enough to remember the great American chestnuts. You know, they were regarded as the finest chestnut in the world, one of the most important trees economically, globally. Um, and they used to grow in these huge forests down the east, eastern seaboard of the United States. Uh, the chestnut blight, a little ascomycete, a little kind of cup-shaped fungus um, called Cryphonectria parasitica, arrived in 1904 because they were importing Japanese chestnut trees. It got into the American chestnut and in the space of 40 years it caught, killed 4 billion. And even now, even now in 2020, there has been no success in breeding programs or developing programs in which the American chestnut can be introduced back into the United States. Some of us may remember the Dutch elm disease. Now I remember as a child walking to school with my mother and my sister and my mother being gripped by, by, um, by all, the, all the elm trees dying. And, and as a young child I can remember it being something that was absolutely terrible that was happening. And this was a fungal disease uh, by fungus called, called Ophios, Ophiostoma, um, which is spread by bark beetles. It hitches onto the back of bark beetles. It was introduced into Europe on imported wood from Asia in 1910. It caused a little bit of disease, but it wasn't too serious. But then a virulent strain was introduced in 1967. It attacked the English elm, and there was a reason for this. The English elm is just a single clone, and the smooth-leaved elm. And by 1990, 23 years later, 25 million elm trees were dead. More than 90% of the elm tree population of um, the UK and Ireland had, had, had succumbed to the disease. In Ireland, our witch elm, which is now really just confined to a few kind of secret glens around the country, rocky areas where, where there's no kind of disturbance, they showed more resistance. But all, many elm trees, the English elm and the smoother leaved elm, were planted in the early 1900s in Ireland, formed very, very beautiful trees, and also all of those were, were, um, were succumbed to the disease. 
And now in 2020, you can still see elm trees in the hedgerows and they grow for a while. The roots are still alive. They're what's known as functionally extinct. So the roots are alive and you have these, these, these kind of these, these shoots which grow up and they grow up for five meters or so, um, but then they always succumb. Now there are a very few resistant elm trees around and I'll, I'll talk about that later. Here you can see the track marks made by the elm bark beetle and here is the fungus. The disease that we do know about because it's it's happening over the last 10 years is ash dieback disease. Now this is a disease which is caused by another of these ascomycete fungi, these little cup shaped fungi. You'll all be familiar with the mushrooms and toadstools which have caps and gills underneath the caps and then they have stems. Um, but the ascomycetes, they're like little cups and the spores are held in the cup. Okay. So Hymenocyphus fraxineus. This originated in Asia again, where it's an endophyte. It's an endophyte, is, it's a harmless leaf fungus. It just grows happily on Manchurian ash, doesn't cause any problem, doesn't cause any disease. Now, somehow it got to Poland, um, probably around 2006. It was identified in 2009, um, and by which time it had become very virulent on our European ash, Praxinus excelsior. By 2012, three years later, it had spread to 25 European countries, including Ireland. Now that's an unprecedented rate of spread for any organism. No organism can spread that fast without help. And you know, it's the transport of goods, the transport of materials, the transport of people, um, which is uh, sort of exacerbating the spread. Six years later, and um, the government, the Irish government, as, as elsewhere in Europe, they really went to a lot of effort to try and contain the disease. Um, but it was too late, nothing could be done, and in 2018 the government concluded that it was not feasible to control the disease. And now 95% may be lost across Europe. Um, it's not all lost, I have more encouraging news to tell you later, um, but the vast majority of our ash trees are going. And here, this is the lane on which I live in East Clare, and you can see every 20 metres, 10, 20 metres, there's a dead ash tree. And it actually creates a very distressing landscape. But also, if you think about the ecosystem services that ash trees provide, you know, our water table rising without them, all those species associated, um, you know, it's a, it's a devastating loss. And now it doesn't stop. So now um, the Irish government and Chagas Forest Service are very concerned about what's known as the sudden larch death. Now, this is caused by an oomycete. Now, these aren't fungi, they're often associated with fungi, they're not fungi, um, I'll show you later. Um, and the genus is Phytophthora, Phytophthora remorum. Okay, its origin isn't known. In, it, it arrived and it appeared simultaneously in European nurseries and Californian forests in the early 1990s. And by 2002, it was beginning to be seen in rhododendron in garden centers in Ireland. By 2003, it had escaped into the wild and it was on wild rhododendron ponticum. And then in 2010, it was found in commercial larch and it's currently recorded in 56 locations across the country. And that's almost certainly an underestimate. And here you have a, a picture of the fine larch forest. This is up in Dublin, a um, picture produced by the Irish Times. And here you have in Europe, a dead larch forest. So, is our sudden, this sudden larch death, is this a cause for concern? Is this, going to, is this going to be as bad as ash dieback? Is this going to be as bad as chestnut blight? Is this going to be as bad as Dutch elm disease? Well, let's have a look. Is the cause for concern? Well, the trouble with Phytophthora remorum is that it's not species specific. And that means whereas with Dutch elm disease, it just attacked elm trees and chestnut blight just attacked chestnut trees and ash dieback has just attacked, attacked, attack, attacked um, ash trees and just actually our European ash where it's been spread onto others. By Trotterum Uramorum, it's not fussy. You know, it's not species specific. And so in Ireland, it's found on larch. It's also been found on beech trees up in the Northern Ireland. It's been found on sweet chestnut and it's been found in one location on Sitka spruce. And so of course, that's of huge significance for commercial forestry in Ireland. In the States, it behaves differently. 
and it's attacking oak and it's attacking ornamentals like the viburnum, rhododendron, camellia, camellias and so, so on and so forth, oleanders and things like such and so forth. Okay, so we know it's not species, species specific, it can attack any trees. We also know that Phytophthora infestans, very closely related to Phytophthora morum, um, was the cause of potato blight. And, you know, potato blight, the, the, the devastating impact of that in the 1800s. And Richard O'Hanlon from Chagas has said that Ireland's cool, wet maritime climate provides ideal conditions for spread. Well, it certainly does because of the nature of this organism. So let's just have a look, another look to see how much we should be concerned about, about this phytophthora. Well, umai seeds, they're not fungi, you know. So if this is, um, you, you may not be able to see this very well, and it's not very well drawn, but it's, this is the evolutionary tree. Okay, so here back in early, early kind of times with the bacteria and then the slime molds. And the umai seeds came off this branch, this evolution branched off very, very early. Here are the animals, here are the fungi, and here are the plants. Fungi are much more closely associated with animals than they are with plants, even though they used to be in the plant kingdom. Now, the difference between the umai seeds and the fungi, and it's quite important, is that the cell walls of fungi are made of chitin, and the cell walls of umai seeds are made of cellulose. And the other thing about these umai seeds is that they, they can swim. They have, they, their spores have little flagella, which makes them motile. Now, back in my plant pathology days, um, Phytophthora was an incredibly difficult um, organism to actually culture in the laboratory. The only way you could get it to grow even a tiny bit was on, was on, was on an agar made from um, frozen peas um, with the brand bird's eye, bird's eye frozen pea agar. There was no, not a, a, another brand of, another brand of peas didn't work. It had to be bird's eye. And th that was the only medium in which Phytophthora could be grown. I mean, it may have changed now. So we know that they can, they're very difficult organisms. They can spread rapidly. They're motile. They spread by rain splash. So a raindrop just lands into a, into the kind of, into the, into the little fruit body of the, the, the umai seeds and, um, and the spores just go whoosh. And this is the way they spread. And this is why Ireland is such a good place for them to spread because we have so much rain. Now there's another feature about fungi and microorganisms in general which is an important one to know and that's what's known as inoculum potential. Now this is the amount of energy available for a fungus or a bacterium or a new mycete um, that it, the, the energy that it needs to infect its host. So what happens is they remain completely hidden and they're just growing away, growing away, growing away, uh, sort of just building up their energy, building up their kind of, their mass. And then it'll reach a sudden threshold and then it just goes bang. And there's an explosion of infection. And this is what happened with ash dieback. I can remember walking my lanes five years ago and looking at the ash trees and thinking, yeah, there's no ash, there's no ash dieback here. You know, it, it, this, isn't, this isn't happening, this isn't serious. And within six months, I was looking at every single tree and thinking, goodness, you know, what's happening? This disease has suddenly, not only has it got reached one or two trees, but it is in all of the trees. And that's because of this build up, this inoculum potential. So that's the, that's the sudden larch death. This is one of, the, that's one of the diseases that probably in Ireland and elsewhere we're most worried about. But sadly, it doesn't stop there. And, you know, it was actually, I've, I've, I've produced a list here. Now, um, if there's anyone from Chagas or, or the Forest Service in the audience, you may be able to correct me on this list. Um, because there are so many that it's hard to know which are going to be the most serious. But the emerald ash borer, well, this is devastating for the forests in the United States and in Russia. It hasn't got into Europe yet. And the EU has, in fact, banned all ash wood. The, the importation of any ash wood, including firewood, as a way of trying to prevent to prevent the emerald ash borer from getting into Europe. And what will happen is those trees that were, those um, those ash trees that may resistant may stay resistant to ash dieback. If we get the emerald ash borer in, there'll be no chance for them. Um, it'll finish them off. Then we're worried about Phytophthora morum, I've spoken about that. Phy Phytophthora canovii is another one. There's about three or four, Richard O'Hanlon from Chagas has identified probably five or six other Phytophthora species in Ireland 
which have the potential to build up that inoculum potential and to become um, seriously invasive. The oak processionary moth, it's already arrived in Ireland, but it was caught. You may have heard the news a couple of months ago, um, it was found on, a, on, a, on some kind of import and they were able to destroy it and stop it. But it's only a matter of time before it creeps in. And the oak processionary moth is particularly nasty because it forms masses in trees and then the caterpillars drop their hairs. And if you're unfortunate enough to be walking underneath it, when they drop their hairs, it forms a very nasty dermatitis. The other one that we've spoken about already is Xylella fastidiosa. This is this bacteria which is attacking our olive forests. And again, it's like this Phytophthora remorum. It's not species specific. It's not fussy. Um, it doesn't really care what it, what it infects. It can get onto anything. And it particularly goes for um, vaccinium species, you know, blueberries, bilberries, um, all those soft fruits. It goes for olive trees and so on and so forth. And actually one way in which you might be able to help, it becomes very popular to buy these very attractive potted olive trees. You know, they're sort of a few feet high and you buy them for the people for Christmas presents. Well, try and avoid doing that um, because the, there is a risk that it may contain, it may be carrying this xyla. The, the thistroma is the needle blight. Um, this is a fungus which attacks pines. It's already in Ireland. There's several locations where it's been found. Um, the Forest Service is, is very concerned about the brown spot needle blight, which is another fungus which attacks all pine species. So if these get in, um, then our commercial forest is really at risk. And here's the emerald ash borer down below. And this is the, um, this is the dithystroma, the, the red needle blight. Um, and it causes these bottle brush appearance. So all the leaves are dead except the ends, the youngest shoots. And so you have this kind of bottle brush appearance. Uh, there's several, there's two locations in, in Limerick where it has been recorded and it is being contained, um, but very difficult con to contain something that produces millions and millions of spores. So let's go on to um, a more cheerful way of, um, of, looking at, of, of, of looking at things, and that is to see how we can actually help. You know, is the, what can we do? Um, and I just want to show these two photographs of this. There's a wonderful artist called Mark Frith, who was um, commissioned to draw, a fabulous line draw, to draw all the, the veteran oaks, these, these oak trees that are thousands of years old in, in England. And here's just two of them. And just one thing to note is that they're hollow. Okay, they're not solid. In fact, some of the drawings he has is, of the trees are so big and so hollow that, you know, back the Victorians used to have big dinner parties. They used to have a table for 14 in some of these trees that they were so big. But uh, I just want to point out that a hollow tree is not a sick tree. Now, for foresters, for commercial forestry, if you have a tree that becomes hollow, then of course, it loses its value. It loses its economic value. You need, you need, a, you know, you know, you need good solid timber. Um, but in the environment for our native species, the centre of a tree is, is, is dead. It's, it's made up of what's known as the heartwood. It's dead tissue. The living part of a tree is a thin layer just inside the bark. And this is called the cambial layer. And the rest of that inner part of the tree is actually dead tissue. And what you get, you get these fungi called the heart rot fungi. And they'll often form these kind of brackets on the trunks, you'll see them. Um, you know, and they're rotting out the heart of the tree. But in doing that, all those nutrients are released, which just then seep down into the ground and they're feeding the tree. So the, the, the tree is, the, you know, these old oak trees are fabulous examples of self-sufficiency. They're kind of feeding themselves. You know? And then the other thing is that a hollow tree is more resistant to storms than a solid tree. If you have a solid structure, a solid cone um, or a solid cylinder, um, if you have a big impact against it, it'll knock it over. But if it's hollow, there's, 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 more, there's more chance of flexibility. It's less likely to be pulled over. And I mentioned this because I met somebody in Limerick the other day who, who was um, wanting me to go and have a look at some beech trees and he was about to fell them because he said, these trees are hollow. These trees are, these trees are dangerous. You know, they're getting kids walking underneath them and all that sort of thing. And I was trying to persuade him to say, actually, no. You know, with beech and oak, when you have to start to see a hollow tree, 
you know that tree has a chance of surviving for hundreds of years. And actually I read something the other day just about oak trees and apparently an oak tree can grow for 300 years and then it can go dormant for 300 years and just stop growing completely to all extent and purposes be a dead tree and then it can start growing again. Okay, so anyway, in native species, if you see hollow trees, um, they are ones to be protected um, because they have a chance of becoming old. Okay, so how can we help? Well, first of all, look out for how healthy ash trees and collect seed. And we're extremely lucky in Ireland to have, you know, so much excellent work being done by Chagas. And, um, you know, there's, 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 there's really very good research being done there on, you know, the huge concern about some of these invasive diseases. And, and Miguel Garis, he's, 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 he's one of the scientists working there. And he's, there are two projects, two projects on ash dieback um, that Chagas has been running since 2015, which, are, which involve building up the gene bank. Um, so Miguel has been going around, he's, he's been collecting up genetic material um, from Ireland and, and combining it with material from Europe, uh, there's kind of cooperative kind of action there, um, with the aim eventually of being able to produce tolerant ash seed, which is ash seed to restore ash to our ash forests and hedgerows. Um, now Miguel has got enough samples for ash, but he asks the public to look out for healthy trees or mildly um, affected trees and collect seed. And he also says, I, I didn't realize this was the case. I thought our ash, I was much more of a pessimist. I thought all our ash trees were completely lost, but no, he says some of them will be resistant. And even those ones that show sign of disease, you know, not all of them will become very seriously infected. And so some, about 20%, may just have a moderate disease. And those are the ones that realistically can be saved. Now, um, Miguel is also working on um, elm trees, and if you do know of old, healthy elm trees, then he would like to know about it. Okay, so look out for these healthy ash and look out for healthy elm. And then um, Miguel very kindly gave me some advice um, for this webinar about um, what we can do as individuals in terms of the trees, the ash trees around us. So identify healthy trees, look out for them, one to three percent will be resistant. So if they're growing in a kind of a crowded area, just kind of clear the area around them, give as much chance, give them as much chance of surviving as possible and then collect the seed. Now, Miguel may be able to give us, I don't know whether you're in, in the audience, Miguel, but if you are, you may be able to give us guidance on, on how to store the seed. Otherwise, I have some very comprehensive information from the states where they're storing seed because of the emerald ash borer. Um, so he also says that up to 20% of our trees show moderate tolerance, tolerance and these can be saved. The ash plantations are very unlikely to be saved and this and this and you can understand this because if you think about that that slide before I was talking about the inoculum potential where where you have nothing but ash trees in a sh small area well you know the when the when the ash dieback disease when the hymenocyphus gets in there you know it's just going to build up its inoculum and build up its inoculum and there's, there's really very little chance for any of these trees to be able to to, to build resistance, um, to, to, remain, to remain resistant to the disease. The best thing to do is remove very susceptible trees. Okay, now this can be quite a, quite a challenge because, you know, sometimes, you know, it's the, a dead tree, a dead ash tree actually provides a really important habitat for invertebrates. Um, it also provides a habitat for bats, um, birds, owls. So, you know, it may be very good to be leaving some ash trees standing, even when they're dead. Um, but in some cases, when they're very susceptible, when they're really, um, when, they, when they die, when they're becoming, you know, the, the attack is very quick, then it's probably best to, to remove them so that you're taking out that disease potential from the surrounding areas. Um, he also says to remove leaf litter around pressure specimens. You can't be doing this on a large scale in the spring and the autumn because the fungus produces spores on the leaf litter. And I have a mature ash in my garden, which I've been trying to protect. I mean, all the ash trees around are dead. There's, there's, there's no, there's no, there's no um, tolerance in, in this, my particular area of East Clare. But, um, um, but I have been, I rake up the leaves and I burn them. So I make sure that I'm trying to keep that inoculum potential as low as I can to prevent, to prevent the tree from, pretend it, from attacking the tree. Now, this summer I began to see the tips of, the, of, of some of the branches going. So I know that it's infected, but you know, possibly I may be able to kind of, it may be one that's, that retains some resistance. I hope so anyway. 
The other thing is that changes in pH can disrupt the fungal life cycle. You know, fungi in general hey, hate alkaline conditions. You know, so I've put seaweed around mine because that creates a, an alkaline condition. It creates a very salty condition as well. Um, and also, you know, there's a really fine ash tree in St. Stephen's Green in the middle of Dublin. And it's not looking, you know, there's no sign of disease and it may be healthy because it's in a, in a comparatively polluted environment. And this particular fungus doesn't like polluted environments. So uh, something to say for the middle of cities. Okay. Number third one, buy local. Okay, so, I mean, I think this must be obvious now, is choose native species grown from Irish seed in Ireland. And, you know, and there's a number of small businesses around in Clare and Limerick where they're, they're growing native species from seed. It's all local provenance stuff. Use those, get those, because imported trees as I've, as I've described, um, you know, including those imported trees, which are, you know, native imported trees um, um, and ornamentals because they carry a very high risk of disease. It's, it's almost too much to be worth it. You know, it's like those olive trees in pots. Um, find an alternative present. Don't buy, don't buy them. Um, there's too, there's too much, too great a risk. And then biosecurity and, you know, just with COVID, COVID is a wonderful example about how, you know, the washing hands and the masks and so on and so forth. It's all about hygiene. And this, this is really true in, um, in, in, for tree diseases, for fungal diseases, bacterial diseases, you know, um, your biosecurity. So if you're using equipment, clean it before you go onto a site and clean it before you leave the site, whether it's a spades or a tractor or a wheelbarrow or a lawnmower, um, you know, your boots, um, off and Phytophthora amorum, this sudden large, large death, it's, it hibernates in leaf litter and soil. So, you know, you're walking through it and you're going to be picking up the spores on your boots. So again, you know, just take time to wash your boots before you go into, it, into, into the environment. And again, before you, you come out, just clean everything, clean everything. Now there's some very expensive um, biosecurity agents out there, like Vercon and things like this, but actually we do know that Milton's um, you know, bog standard sterilizing fluid, um, that this is effective against the crayfish plague, Aphanomyces statue, which is another fungus. So if it can actually control, if it's actually effective and can kill, can kill the crayfish plague, then it's, it's likely to have at least some effect. It have, it's likely to at least partially kill um, some of these other fungal, um, fungal diseases. So this is a good one to use and it's very cheap and it breaks down, it's non-toxic in soil. Don't carry plant products or seed into Ireland. Don't be part of this globalization. You know, and I know how, um, you know, I come from a family of keen gardeners and botanists, you know, and, and the temptation when you're abroad is to pick up a few seeds or a few little kind of cuttings of this or the, or t'other, you know, or bring a few, few plant materials back. Um, well, don't. Um, it's got to the point where um, that temptation has to be overcome. Um, uh, don't carry it. And, you know, and, and the whole thing about transporting transporting plants like plant products from one area to another sharing them with your neighbors and so on and so forth it's time to start being really careful and then for instance in the US um, very strict regulation on what is allowed into the country um, the, 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 <coughs> excuse me this is a this is an all island initiative um, treecheck.net. So this is the way you can download it onto your smartphone and it's a way by which you can, you can report um, forest pathogens, tree disease, invasive tree diseases when you see them. Um, it's, it's reasonably user friendly. But the problem is and it, tree diseases can be incredibly difficult to identify or um, well, the causal agent, you know, what's actually causing the disease. It can be very difficult because often the symptoms all look the same and often a tree will carry on looking healthy until it's too late. You know, so a lot of diseases were called wilted leaves and discoloration of, of leaves and, um, and so on and so forth and, and you know, lesions in the, in the bark. Um, so really we need more than this. We, this is very useful, but we need help to be able to use this appropriately. Um, and in the UK, the Woodland Trust has produced, uh, and, the, and the Forest Commission have produced this fantastic, um, it, it is a fantastic system called Observatory. 
Okay, and so it's a lovely website. I've got, I'll show you the, the link at the end. Um, it trains volunteers to spot and report tree pests and diseases. You know, you can submit data to Tree Alert, which is just like the tree check. Um, and then they have, the website is fabulous. It has user-friendly toolkits for different diseases, it has videos and field guides, um, and it helps people learn how to identify the diseases. And so that then, it is possible to be able to present some really useful information onto the Tree Check Net app or the or the Tree Alert app. Um, we don't have this in Ireland, but you know, perhaps I don't know the Tree Council or somebody, you know, some somebody would actually consider setting up a user-friendly recording system or at least providing the public with some training so that we can begin to accurately identify um, what's around. Eight, well, raise awareness of trees in our landscapes. Um, no, no, there's a very interesting kind of academic paper um, by Ericsson in 2019, I can send the link to anyone who's interested, um, who showed this is done on a European wide level, um, is looking at the public awareness of forest pathogens. So, um, and this is countrywide. And so they showed huge variation. So there are some countries which are really aware of forest pathogens and doing lots about it, and other countries which are where the awareness is very low. Now, in general, the public have, they really want to see stringent measures for um, plant production, including labeling, you know, the control, the phytosanitation at the, at the ports and so on. They want to see these measures put into place so that we can control these diseases. Um, but then on the other hand, they definitely don't want to be prevented from being able to go out into, into the natural environment and being able to go out into the woods um, and, in, and enjoy the environments um, to be prevented from doing that because of diseases. But that might come you know, the risk, of, the risk of people spreading diseases is also very high. Um, raising awareness, you know, there's nothing better than, than raising awareness with children. Children are our best scientists. They're the most observant. You know, their minds are fresh. They don't have any pre-assumed ideas about, you know, what they should and shouldn't know and so forth. And the Talking to Trees project was set up by Chris Packham um, and it's, it's allowing children, it's helping children deepen their connection with nature. It's like the Forest Bathing Initiative in Japan, which has now come to Ireland and Europe. You know, it's helping people to deepen their connection with their local environment. Um, and, 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 and the results of this study, have, this, this project has shown that children who do have developed this connection you know, they become so much more engaged and motivated um, in so many different ways. You know, the, 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 the engagement with nature in, in, um, for children has, has multiple benefits. Um, not, the, not, not time to talk about it this evening. Okay, help a school create a tree nursery from local seed, you know, um, go out and collect seed. You know, there seems to be this thing that, you know, it'd be terribly difficult to grow a tree from seed. It's not at all difficult. Um, and John McCowan from, from Monaghan, who's, who's, who has been growing trees all his life, um, says the thing to do is just go out and collect seeds and just plant them. Just plant them straight away. Don't worry about the scarification or any of these complex things that might be needed. Just plant them just sow them. And this is the Dunnerman box. Um, this is in East Clare, the Woodland League, uh, going around schools and, and, and growing, producing these boxes for children to, um, to prepare their, their tree seedlings. And this is Gortbrack Organic Farm in Kerry, again, where they're, where they're working with children and adults around growing trees. The ninth one. Um, and these two are probably the most important, apart from biosecurity, you know, um, as communities, as individuals, we're going out and we're planting trees, everyone's encouraging us to plant trees, you know, but which trees, um, but which trees do we plant? You know, um, the impact of climate change, well, beach is very shallow rooted, um, it can't tolerate drought, it can't tolerate water logging, so is there any point planting beach any longer, you know, is it just going to succumb to climate change? Um, and that's true of many species. We need to be looking at the species and how it's going to be able to respond as our climate changes over the next 10, 20, 30 years. Really important, as Ken Whelan said, plant trees for shade, particularly around water bodies. You know, the whole earth is hotting up and we need to kind of create that shade over, over the earth um, in order to keep things cool. And then consider susceptibility to invasive tree diseases. And this is where it really does get quite depressing because, you know, people say, okay, Fran, what, what can I plant? You know, and you think, well, okay, you can't plant ash. 
not legal, you know, no point anyway. Um, is there, is there much point planting larch? How quickly is that phytophthora going to spread across the country? You know, is, is it going to just succumb? What about beech? Well, that's, that's, that's susceptible to phytophthora and it's susceptible to climate change. Any point planting beech? You know, sweet chestnut, well, that's, that's, you know, that's susceptible to phytophthora and xylella and a load of other things, you know, so the chestnut blight. So any point you know, planting that, um, and so on and so forth. So these, we, we need to be looking very carefully at how we're planting as well. No monocultures any longer. Make sure it's the woodland has a good mixture of species. And then finally, the topic that interests me most is the way that um, plants and fungi, trees and fungi and insects interact together, you know, and, and, and it's an incredibly complex relationship. And if you think of a fungus, you know, a fungus with a tree will have the relationship, it'll be symbiotic on the roots, forms these incredible mycorrhizal, mutually beneficial relationships on the roots. You know, you have the heart rot fungi, which are helping the tree to become hollow so that it can survive for thousands of years, you know, hundreds of years um, and then you have these pathogens and sometimes these pathogens once were harmless fungi and they suddenly changed to become these pathogens you know but anyway um there's excellent work by done by Di mitchell and the academic papers if anybody wants the links and you've got access to university libraries i really encourage you to read her work it's it's very very good but anyway she's been working on which native species can best replace ash trees ecosystem services and its role as a host to those 1,028 species that we've been, you know, I was talking about earlier. Okay, so there are these two aspects. There's ash, fabulous ecosystem function, and then fabulous host to many species. So which species, as our ash trees die, which species can we plant which are going to replace those, those, those roles, those functions? Well, it's not simple, you know, and, and you kind of really need to read her papers to get the kind of full picture. But here we have us at the table. So these are the most suitable in terms of ecosystem function and species use, and these are the least suitable. So if we're concerned primarily with ecosystem function, then older, alder, on, okay, small leaf lime, common walnut, beech and birch, surprising actually, but these are the least suitable. And then in terms of being a host to other species, completely different list, oak, okay, sycamore, birch, older. And her conclusions on some of the most recent research was, you know, in, if you're just actually really needing to kind of get some general idea, then if you want trees to replace ash for both their functions, for this, their host to species and also their, their um, ecosystem function, then older, and um, sycamore are probably the two best ones. So that's it. And I just want to finish with um, this final thing. Please look up the Chagas information, Miguel Gorez and um, 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 the, the research that's being done in Chagas. It's really, it's really good. It's very interesting. The Forest Service has some good um, fact sheets um, about different species. Um, Treecheck.net, this is this recording system that you can use and you can download it onto your smartphone and it's quite good. And then if you want to learn a bit more about um, the Observatory Woodland Trust, um, here's the link. Um, and then for any of the academic um, work that I've kind of shown um, tonight, I'd be very happy to provide the references and citations for those papers. Um, so thank you very much. I hope um, you've learned something and I hope that you'll go away and, and feel inspired that it's not too late, that there are things that we can do as individuals and communities um, to save our trees. Thank you. Thank you very much, Fran. That was absolutely terrifying. Um, <laughs> we, we don't have any very many questions because I think people are too scared <laughs> to ask. Um, we have a few comments from Peter and he's wondering how the landscape will recover from the loss of ash trees, which I think we're all wondering that. Um, it really is frightening to think that not only could we lose all of our ash trees, but we could lose so many other species as well. And Peter also raises a very um, pertinent issue of health and safety. Um, how are we going to deal with all these dying trees along roadsides? Um, it's a, it's a huge problem. I don't think we have easy answers to that. 
Yeah. I think um, um, I haven't quite got the figures, but I think um, in Europe, um, the cost of um, these tree diseases is in the region of about 12 billion a year. And that's just in terms of infrastructure, public health, uh, you know, the cost of felling them. Um, you know, if anybody's looking, wanting to kind of, you know, develop a new business, um, learn how to fell trees. It's going to be, there's going to be a huge demand for it. Yeah. And in fact, I mean, in response to Peter's question, well, our landscapes, you know, for us, because, you know, in our, from our eyes, um, we only see the environment so crudely. We're not seeing the kind of the incredible intricacy and intimacy that's going on in the environment. Um, and so we will see the landscape recover when the ash trees have gone. Um, but in fact, the environment won't recover. Um, it'll take it'll take years and years and years for, in fact, the, that those those links, those cogs, um, to to reconnect. Yeah. If they ever can, which is a really if they ever can, yeah, and and of course, I mean, you know, the big risk, and actually, you know, I, about five years ago when I first started getting interested in ash dieback, um, you know, I was kind of going around saying, look, you know, if we don't do something about this, we're going to be waking up to a landscape of dead trees in ten years, and um, and and you know, I kind of sort of shut up for a bit because I thought, well, that's not right. But actually I'm beginning to think this is the truth. It is true. And uh, if, if there's some actions not taken, we're going to, our, our forests globally um, could be devastated. Yeah, could be devastated. But there are things we can do. So we mustn't, you know, let's not, let's not go home depressed. That's really important. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Fran. And we'll be putting the video um, up online and also sharing the links on our website if anybody wants to, to get them. So thank you all very, very much for coming along tonight. Uh, thank you, Fran, for that. And we've had some very nice comments from people who've obviously found your talk very thought-provoking, very interesting. So thank you, Fran. Thank you. Thank you very thank much. You, thank you.